saxophonists. Today we're going to be doing a video about my top 10 things to improve on your scales to prepare yourself for an all state audition or perhaps an all district or all county audition that you have in your area. If you do not already know all the correct notes for all the scales, that is not something that we're going to dive into in this video with detail. We're going to talk about other things that people may not consider. So if you're a saxophone student and you don't know all the notes and all of the required scales that you're supposed to do, my advice is that you stop this video and make sure that you have learned all that before taking the advice that I'm going to give you today. My list is going to go from most obvious thing to maybe not as obvious thing. Hopefully you already know some of the information that I'm going to share with you today that's been shared from a private teacher or a band teacher in the past, but some of it may not be. So these are my top 10 things to help improve your scales for an all-state audition. Without any further ado, let's go. Students, did you know you can actually score just about as many points as you can with your etudes as you are with scales? Sometimes you can do even more depending on the amount of octaves that you play. Scales are the things that make us play all the etudes better. So it is the most often overlooked part of the average student when they're preparing these auditions. So if you know your scale is really awesome, then you're going to have a much more awesome audition as well, and you're probably going to prepare your etudes better as well. So the first thing I'm going to say in our scale of 1 to 10 in, in my recommendations is number one, you've got to use a metronome. If you're not practicing with a metronome, then you're telling me that you're better than a metronome. If you use a metronome all the time when you're practicing scales, 99.99% of the time, then when you actually have to perform those scales for real, you're going to be a lot more successful. These days, there's no excuse. Most all of us have some kind of device at home, whether it's a tablet or a computer or a phone, and a lot of those kind of metronome things that we can download on those devices is often free. Since the Allstate recommendations on the required audition material list says it should be a minimum of quarter note equals 120, we're going to go ahead and set our metronome of 120. <laughs> that I had a subdivision that was happening in that metronome so you could hear the eighth note that happens in between. That typically helps students stay more secure with their rhythm. I'm going to play that same scale without a metronome now. Hopefully you could tell that that scale didn't sound nearly as rhythmic or even. Now, if I play without a metronome right now, in my own honest playing, I would be able to stay pretty secure. Please know that I was actually exaggerating that a little bit, but it's based on things that I've heard in the past from all kinds of auditions, okay? If a student was playing a scale in that fashion, it's very obvious that they were not working on these with a metronome. Besides making you more rhythmically secure when you're playing scales, the other really positive thing that the metronome will do for you is that you need to make sure that you're setting it for the same tempo for all of your scales. If you can't play it at 120, then you need to start at a slower pace to where you can play all the scales at the same speed. This is a great thing for your audition because if you play all your scales at pretty much the same speed, it's going to show the adjudicator who's listening to you that you are very consistent. We've all gotten to those scales before that we are tending to stumble with or not as comfortable with. And if we're not working with them regularly with a metronome, then we're gonna play those scales a lot slower. If by chance we do that, and one of the other scales right after that happens to be one that we're really comfortable with, we might end up playing it faster than the rest just because we're more comfortable with it. So an example of that would sound something like this. I'm gonna play two scales back to back, and I'm going to play one of them, obviously, like I'm struggling, and then one of them like it's a very comfortable scale. All right, so I'm going to start with a concert C scale right now. You 
don't want to have one scale that sounds like you're struggling because of tempo and one scale sounding like you know that one so much better because of tempo. If you're practicing all the scales at the same speed, then they're all going to sound more at the same tempo and then you're going to sound better. The second recommendation on my list, going down from ob most obvious to less, is going to be number two, and that is playing all the scales multiple octaves that are able to on saxophone within the normal range. So whether you're playing alto or tenor or baritone saxophone, the scales on saxophone, and that would be, is E, and I'm giving you those notes on saxophone, I'm not giving you concert pitches. So E scale, D scale, C scale, F scale, B flat scale, and the chromatic scale are all scales that should be done to octaves for those players who are going to be serious about this audition. If you don't know the fingerings for those second octave scales, that's one of those goals that you need to make a primary objective right now. suggested to be at 144 so we'll do that two octaves right now again if that's a tempo that you cannot achieve you need to start working on that slower obvious to less obvious is something that happens quite a bit believe it or not and that is to know the correct order the order that's listed on the Allstate requirements is also giving it to you in a concert pitch so you have to transpose that for saxophone so if you're playing alto saxophone or baritone saxophone your first scale is going to be your E scale on saxophone one two three four five is what that note starts on all right because it says concert G very often we will possibly hear players that start on their G scale and then play everything out of order, okay? So you need to make sure that you're starting it on the right uh, scale order. If you're on tenor saxophone, then your first scale is going to be an A, okay? So that's just one and two, that's your first scale. And then it goes in order from there, all right? So make sure that you know the correct order and that you're not playing them out of order. Another thing that commonly players do is that they play the scales, uh, maybe starting on the right one, but then playing them in a different order. Okay, so when you start on E, okay, your next scale after that is going to be A. Your next scale after that is going to be D, and so on. Okay, so you need to make sure that you do that. What we often hear sometimes is that the first scale that a student might play might be the right one. 
And they'll finish that. And then the next scale they play will be the next diatonic scale maybe going up, okay? Or the next higher scale on their range. So they might do an F scale next. And then after that, they might play G. And that might be a way that people have practiced their scales in a band room or individually, but that's not the correct order for what the scales are supposed to be done in. So make sure you're looking at those requirements very, very carefully. Next on my list of most obvious to less obvious is going to be knowing the correct alternate fingerings. Okay, so even though I said we're not going to talk about the actual note names and all the scales right now because that's something that you need to do on your own, there is going to be instances where we need to use uh, a specific fingering for certain scales. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a couple of those right now for the set of middle school scales. Okay, so the first thing is we're going to talk about the chromatic scale. When your chromatic scale starts on low C, Okay, if you were watching my fingers, you may have known that I was not fingering F sharp the traditional way, which is one, two, three, two. Okay, what I'm using is what's known as a side F sharp fingering here, that's what we call it here in the United States, okay, which uses a chromatic fingering down here. If you happen to be someone that switched from clarinet, there's a very similar fingering on clarinet too. So when you're playing in the chromatic scale, you need to make sure that you're not swip swapping between F and F sharp that you're going F to F sharp on most instruments. It might be an oval looking pearl key, all right? And you're gonna hit that with your ring finger. You would do that on the way up and on the way down on your chromatic scale so that you're not swip swapping back and forth, all right? The next really major one to know is also on the chromatic scale that we are fingering B flat, which is in the traditional way of known as our side B flat fingering, okay? Which is one, two, and that first side key on the bottom, that we're doing that because it's a chromatic fingering for that particular um, uh, note. So we want to use that also in both octaves, all right? Uh, also in the chromatic scale, I'm using what's known as a side C fingering, so that on the way up, I am not swip swapping the fingers here. The top of the chromatic scale for um, saxophone is a higher C, and being that that's the very top and I'm coming right back down, I'm also using that fingering there as well. The side C fingering is the middle of these side keys while you're holding down your first finger for B. This is also how you would trill from B to C. So I'm using that in the chromatic scale, which I'm going to do sort of slowly right now. I'll start on G this time, so you can also see this side B flat button that I use. And if I was towards the top of the scale, I'm going to come right back down using that side C fingering. Okay, so it's important to know those correct fingerings, all right? The next scale we're going to address is for the arpeggio in your F scale, and that's you starting on your F. So when we play the arpeggio, it's F, A, C, F, A, C, F, all the way to the top for both octaves. And although we would finger that high F with all of the palm keys and our top E button down here for the side key, that's how we would finger F when we're going up the scale. However, in the arpeggio, we don't want to go from playing C to pushing down all of those buttons. So the proper fingering to use for this scale is what's known as a front F, or uh, in France, they call this the X key. And that's that funny looking button that's above your B key. And so we wanna use that along with our C button, which is the second finger. So that makes it easy to go from high C to high F immediately. If that note doesn't come out for you right away, and sounds like that, then your air's gotta be a little faster, and you may wanna try pushing your jaw just a tiny bit more forward, okay? That makes that arpeggio a lot faster and more smooth. Again, know your alternate fingerings.
Next on my list of most obvious to less obvious is number five. And we're gonna say less staccato, more legato. Hopefully you know what those words mean. Staccato is talking about the space and separation between notes. And legato is talking about how smooth notes are going to be and how connected they're gonna be. Oftentimes, students will play scales where they're articulating the notes ascending and slurring descending, which is exactly what the audition requirements state. However, it doesn't say that they need to be staccato. And so oftentimes we have students that'll play that up and they'll play everything very hard and very short. So I'm gonna give you an example of uh, a, a more, less great way to play that. Hopefully you could hear how hard the tongue sound and how kind of pecky everything sound. It wasn't the most favorable of tone quality. So my recommendation is you want to be able to tell that we, you are articulating as you ascend, but you don't have to play it hard and short, okay? So let's make that a little bit more smooth. And suddenly, we're gonna start to make more characteristic tones by doing that and not being so hard with the tongue. Next on my list is number six, and that is to avoid over-tonguing or accenting the first or the last note of any of the scales. This is a common issue for young players when they're playing scales that start in the low register. So for example, if I play a C scale right now, hopefully you could tell that the first note sounded explosive. It sounded like I was about to take the paint off of the wall in, in the room here. So we don't need to tongue harder to get those notes out. So we have to work on being able to get those notes out with our air and a good embouchure and making sure that we don't have to over articulate that. On the flip side, we want to make sure that the very last note that we are playing, uh, whether it's at the top or at the bottom of something, that we're not accenting that either. Okay, so right now if I do an arpeggio on that same scale, hopefully you could hear that the end of that was extremely much louder than the other notes and it sounded like I was over accenting it. So we don't want any notes within our scales or arpeggios to stick out or sound louder than others. So we want to make sure that we can have a smooth sound on all of that. So hopefully you could tell I was trying to get that first note to come out very clearly but not bombastically. Next on my list is number seven, and that's to avoid ballooning the last note of a scale, which is almost related to the last one that we recommended. So when we get to the very end, sometimes we're not paying attention to the sound that we get at the end of an arpeggio. And so you wanna make sure that that note sounds nice and even and doesn't have this ballooning or, or crescendo at the end of a note. I was demonstrating it with our C scale on the last um, recommendation, so I'm gonna use the same scale if I was to play the arpeggio. Could you hear that I was getting louder on that last note, okay? Again, it had that sense of like a balloon. We want to avoid that at the ends of scales or at the ends of arpeggios. Again, we want more even sounds on all of that. Next on my list is probably could have gone further up in our list, but I put it as number eight anyway, okay? And so we want to make sure that we don't have the arpeggio notes that sound louder than other notes within what we call the tonic notes. So if we're playing, for example, a C scale, every time we land on a C and that's a tonic note, that note should not sound louder. So if I come back to that same arpeggio again, uh, I'm going to play you an example of doing that. You might be doing that often and not realize that you're doing that. So 
So once again, we're going to try to be more even with everything and making sure that we're not making any of those notes stick out more than others. <laughs> on that as being a good, good habit for us. Next on my list is number nine, and also probably could have gone higher on the list, but that's okay. Okay, and that is to avoid extra notes. Extra notes could be things when we're moving our fingers between notes, and we have another note that comes out, almost sounds like a grace note from time to time. So practicing with a metronome will help you do this, but you have to be able to hear that you're doing that. Unfortunately, most judges, when they're listening to recordings of this, may count those extra notes as incorrect notes. So even if you played all the correct notes in a scale, but you had three or four extra notes, that might reduce your score a little bit. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of that. We're gonna, this time I'm going to use an A scale, okay, starting on one and two. So if I play this scale, I played every note that exists in that scale, but you could hear that there were extra notes. Sometimes that can be nerves. Sometimes that could be uh, maybe there's something mechanically not going uh, correctly on your instrument, like a pad might be sticking, or there might be something wrong with the spring mechanism on your instrument. So it's important to know if that's the issue that you get that taken care of. And it's also important to get to get rid of all of those nerves, again, by going back to what I said, number one. If you practice your scales with a metronome and you're listening for those things, you're going to get rid of all of those extra notes. If you've been watching this long enough, we finally made it to the end. My last recommendation for you. All right. Hopefully you haven't completely fallen asleep. So my last recommendation is... Make sure that we are ending our scales and beginning our new scales with the consistent amount of wait time in between. This ties into two things that I mentioned earlier. Number one, practicing with a metronome. And number two, playing all your scales at the same speed. If you're not doing those two things, this last one isn't going to happen anyway. So another way of saying that is, how long am I going to hold the last note of an arpeggio? How much time am I going to take before I start the next scale? We want that to be the same from scale to scale because it's going to be really consistent. And like I said, playing that with a metronome is going to be a lot easier. So I put my metronome back at 120. I'm going to play the first three scales. For right now, I'm only going to do them one octave for the sake of time. And I'm going to do this two different ways. <laughs> scales. I was waiting the same amount of time before I started. Okay, and it doesn't have to be exactly what I did, but it should be consistent. Now I'm going to do it where I don't do that. scales are going to sound a lot better. I hope this video was helpful to you and good luck practicing your scales for your audition.